New York, the most significant movie market in America, was suddenly awash in cinematic tributes to the wholesome, recreational joys of the nudist way of life. The sexploitation film had arrived. We pause here upon the first incline of what some still view as a slippery slope. 25 years after their demise, sexploitation films remain a subject of controversy. I'm here with Ray Green, the director of Schlock, The Secret History of American Movies. Ray, at the start of your film, you ask the B-movie producer, Roger Corman, to define exploitation. So I'm going to turn the tables on you a bit now and ask you to define sexploitation. An exploitation film is a film where the, uh, I think Herschel Gordon Lewis actually said it best, he said that exploitation movies are basically movies where the marketing uh, uh, trumps everything. With sexploitation, you've narrowed that down to sex. You are selling sex. That is the sell. What's interesting about the films is that despite the fact that that's the sell and that's the emphasis, a lot of interesting work was done was in a sexploitation format, but it was all done by people who had to, had to, had to, whether they wanted to or not, show naked women and show sexual situations that were very risque for their day as a way of getting people to come in and making the exercise viable. So talk me through the, the heyday of sexploitation in the, in the 50s and 60s. What, what were the factors behind it and what forms did it take? The starting point is really a Russ Meyer film called The Immoral Mr. Tease, which was the first film to get wide distribution and to make a lot of money by exploiting nakedness. That film was so successful that it launched uh, a lot of people into this area that, that would not have gone into it otherwise. <laughs> genres that I deal with in my film are uh, the nudie cuties and the, the nudist camp films, which are very related films. And these are sort of bright, sunny, mostly silly films that, that actually show the trace elements of American burlesque. But to me, the really, really interesting sexploitation films came around the mid-1960s when they moved into darker subject matters. Uh, and these films are called The Ruffies. They're very, very disturbing to watch for a lot of people because essentially what they do is they have sort of film noir plots uh, revolving around sex. They actually don't show nearly as much nudity as were shown in the earlier films. But what they do is that they substitute violence, usually directed against women, but not exclusively directed against women, uh, for sex. In The Defilers, directed by Lee Frost, two jaded beatniks kidnap a randomly selected young woman and then physically and sexually assault her over a period of several days. Look at her. I don't feed her. She goes hungry. She belongs to me. Ray Green's film is part of a sexploitation season at the BFI South Bank, screening Ruffies and Nudie Cuties. These sort of adult films last found a home in London at the Scala Cinema in the 70s and 80s, where Helen DeWitt was a programmer. Now, I know that the, the Scala was the... It now becomes kind of a legendary place mm. for, for film enthusiasts to, to have gone to. It's almost like the sort of Hacienda Club in Manchester, <laughs> the Scala in London. Mm. Um, was that an exciting time, and what made it significant? Well, I suppose it was during the 80s, when money was too tight to mention, and it was a gathering point for you know, creatures of the night of many different kinds, because it was before the all-night club explosion. It was the only place you could come to hang out all night on, on Saturday night and get a drink. Um, and, of course, it showed films that you couldn't see anywhere else, and partly that was due to the licensing laws, the certification laws in the UK at the time. Um, and um, partly it was due to the fact that um, the, the cinema, who was set up by Steve Woolley and a group of other people, um, deliberately chose to make it a cult movie house focusing on sex and horror. You were saying about the, the famous Russ Mayer retrospective back in 95, and I remember at the time him saying that he only made the films for money. Mm. It was to make lots of money from a very limited budget, and he said they're not art. They're not art at all. Um, would you dispute that? Do you think that these films have an artistic merit? Um, 
I think some of them do. Um, I think Russ Meyer's a provocateur. <laughs> he's also a very talented filmmaker. You know, he started. He was a he was a newsreel fil um, filmmaker in the World War Two. Um, he knew what he was doing. He knew how to handle a camera, and he knew how to cut film for maximum effect. And I think you just need to look at the opening sequence of Faster Pussycat to know that he knows exactly what he's doing. This rapacious new breed prowls both alone and in packs, operating at any level, any time, anywhere, and with anybody. Who are they? One might be your secretary, your doctor's receptionist, or a dancer in a go-go club. Comparing it to your days at the Scala, um, what audience are you expecting to get to this? Is there is there still room for the Dirty Mac Brigade? <laughs> uh, um, there's a, I think so. You know, the BFI is a broad church, you know, and we welcome everybody who wants wants to kind of come along and, and buy a ticket. I think they're they're films interest for people who are interested certainly in the representation of sexuality in cinema, absolutely. And if they're the Dirty Mac Brigade, so be it, and I'm one of them. Um, uh, but they're interested in people, who, they're interesting for people who are interested in the history of cinema, of alternative cinema, of cinema that's kind of counter Hollywood production values and production modes, and for just something that's kind of different.